God bless you. God bless you. Welcome to the Hour of Deliverance. Now, that's actually the long title is Deliverance Evangelistic Church International. Now, I'm Reverend Dr. K.E. Holmes, and I want to share with you, I shortened the title to Ignorant. I actually should have lengthened it out to the seven places in the New Testament where God says, I would not have you ignorant. Now, the you he's talking about, that's his church. That's the body of Christ. And he says, I would not have you ignorant. And I think most of the time, we're going to look at it and see if it's all seven times, he says brethren. So that lets you know who he's talking to. Now the first, I'm going to give you all seven just in case I don't get to finish it all in this segment. The first one is Romans 1, 13, where he says he wouldn't have us ignorant about the often times that he purposed to come. There's some things we need to know about that. That wasn't just that particular um, Paul in that particular trip to go to, to the Romans. And again, in Romans 11.25, For I would not, brethren, uh, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. And, and he says that ye should be wise in your own conceits. The blindness in part is happened to Israel unto the fullness of the Gentiles come in. The third place that he says it, uh, 1 Corinthians 10.1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all your fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. The third, uh, pardon me, that was number three, the fourth one. 1 Corinthians 12.1, and many of you know that I have a course on spirituals. Uh, that 12, um, 13, and 14, chapters 12, 13, and 14 are on one subject that's in this first, I would not have you ignorant. Now concerning spirituals, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And most of your Bibles say concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. But the word gifts is not in the Greek, and spirituals is in a, um, a part of speech that we don't have in English. So the subject is spirituals. Second Corinthians, the fourth one, pardon me, five. The, let me go back and count. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, second Corinthians is the fifth. I would not have you ignorant. One, eight, second Corinthians, one, eight. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came unto us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch as we despaired even of life. The sixth one, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others have that have no hope. And then the seventh, in Second Peter 3, 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that the day, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, I want to spend time on one of these, two of these in particular. But we're going to look at each one of them in the context which they are in. So let's first go over to Romans. Now my Bible's up here on Genesis. I was telling someone last night that's a, a joke about me that we're always going to end up back in Genesis 1. But right now we're going to look at Romans 1.13 in particular. And I went to Romans 13. And... It's a good thing to know the, the, uh, the books and what the theme is in the particular books of the Bible so that you can just know what the context is when you're going to a particular scripture, the general context. Because after all, it is God who said that, who am I going to show knowledge? Who am I going to teach doctrine? Uh, them that are drawn from the milk, weaned from the breast. And he tells you uh, that... Precept must be upon precept, the general picture. 
and what the laws are that govern everything. And then precept upon precept. God's not stuttering. He says it twice. And line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So that when you know uh, the order of the books, and not just the order that they were written, that's good to know, but the order that they're canonized in. Um, especially when in the Old Covenant, you know that God is the one who gave the Hebrew canon and gave it in the order, not politics. So Paul, in, in Romans 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Notice we want to say that, we want to point out that the scriptures are holy. We live in times now where um, religion is being made to be more than about the, the Judeo-Christian God, the true and living God. If you give that definition to religion, then you need to understand that the scriptures that we talk about are holy. They're set apart, they're above, and they're beyond. And um, that that is extremely significant. And these are promises. Okay? Now he says the promises, particularly concerning verse 3, his son Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now notice the relationships. We've got a couple of things going on here. Concerning his son, okay, the son of God. Notice the scriptures are holy. The prophets had something to say concerning his son. And then particularly Jesus Christ. Jesus, that particular man that walked the earth, Christ, the Messiah. Our Lord, uh, that relationship of lordship, which has to do with Yahweh, God of covenant, which has to do with um, landlord, master of our lives, and all of those different aspects that you see. Uh, Adonai in the Old Covenant. And uh, I do have uh, the names of God where we can see that God gives some particular and distinct circumstances where he reveals his name, reveals the, the meaning of that name or title, but also through that we understand how we're to walk in his image in those things. And uh, so he says, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So that, that's why you have that Jesus part in there. Uh, the, you have the messianic aspect so that you know that Messiah is coming through the seed of David. And that's how he came. God had said that before time. But Jesus, particularly that, that man. And then he says, and that chain link and declared to be son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. Now here we go about this holy again. First we, we know that the scriptures are holy and now he's saying the spirit of holiness and there's a lot there by the resurrection of the dead. Notice the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. This is why one of the reasons why you want to accept Jesus Christ as your savior and as your Lord, because he's the only one that resurrected. He's the only one that actually died and that actually rose from the dead and lives forevermore. Liveth, I love the King James for that, that that ETH tells you that that's an action that happened and is ongoing. You see, Lazarus, Jesus raised from, from the dead. Yes, he did. Called him forth. and uh, But he died. Uh, Again, because it's appointed unto men once to die. But Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he ever lives. Ever, ever, ever lives, as scripture tells us. So by whom we have received grace. So it's by this, it's the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. That's how that happened. By whom we have received grace and apostleship. Now, Paul is talking about himself here. But that's any of us that we, what we receive, grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith 
among all nations for his name. Now, I have a prayer that I like to pray for people, but I want to show you something in it uh, that the Lord bless you and it causes blessings on you, in you, through you, to you, and also because of you. When you know that the light of God and the spirit of holiness um, by the resurrection from the dead resides in you, you also know that things happen because you're there or because you're around or because of you, because you pray. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. That happens because of the, what's promised in the Holy Scriptures and because of all of this holiness that we're talking about. But you can receive, you can't receive something. Uh, well, you can receive unlawfully. And that sets up a whole lot of unlawful things so that you're guaranteed that it's going to be taken from you But if, if it's unlawful. But because we had this lawful, according to this holy scriptures, and by the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead, which Jesus did and fulfilled, now we can receive what he gave. Grace, apostleship, and the ability to obey unto faith. That's not just to obey anything uh, or even one specific thing, but to faith. Now, faith has to do with what is the will of God, that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God among all the saints, all nations. And you want to be able to understand that because it is God who so loved the world that he gave his son. And many of you know that I often deal with um, your relationship uh, in and to the Godhead and things in our time. We're living in times now where the Father is addressing nations. He's addressing the world. Now, it's always going to be through His Son, Jesus Christ. But when we deal with things of the body, uh, well, Jesus is the head of the body. When we deal with things of the Spirit, it is the Spirit of God who you're going to deal with. And there's so much to learn on each of these. But going to what I wouldn't have you to be ignorant, going all the way down to 13, he, when he says these things, uh, in 11, he says, For I long to see you that I might impart some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That's not just so that you can show off or so that you can be a big wig. Those kind of things might happen. You might make um, an open show of the devil and triumph. But I would not have you ignorant concerning what the delay is. Now the first thing, the first thing that God says, I would not have you ignorant. He says it seven times, and you know that seven is very significant. But I would not have you ignorant that oft times I purpose to come to you, 
And there's some serious things that he goes on to tell that I want to teach to you. I want to impart some, some spiritual gift that you're established. But sometimes you need to know and understand that there are delays on some very, very important things. But he says, I wouldn't have you ignorant. And uh, in 11.25, he says, I would not have you for, there's a light shining on there, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, that ye should be wise in your own conceits. Now, notice this. God doesn't want us just wise in our own conceits. And we don't know that when it's us. Um, that the that blindness in part has happened unto Israel and un, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now I really want to deal with this just a little bit where starting out on the chapter he says, I say then, so there's something else that he's already referred to. Hath God cast away his people? He's already on that subject when he says, I wouldn't have you ignorant. He says, God forbid. And this is verse 1 and 11. He's uh, Romans 11. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people. You want to know that. That's part of why you can take Jesus at his word when he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Because the remember how Hebrews tells us that the, the word is a schoolmaster, the old covenant is a schoolmaster, and it teaches us. Well, there you see that God doesn't forsake his people. He's, he's Yahweh. He's God of covenant. He made the covenant. He put us into covenant. And he wants us to keep be covenant keepers. But he's the one that ratifies it. And he's the one who keeps it. So God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. And he doesn't mean knew before. This is foreknew that in the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth, God ordained some things before he even created you and I, before he even called out his people. So he knew them before. And he says, What? Ye not that the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Now notice this. Uh, we want to know that God did not cast away his people, even though there's a punishment going, there's a whipping going on at different times. Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars and I am alone, left alone and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God to him? And, and this is something that you want to pay attention to and I offered that in another course for a whole different reason. But he says, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have bowed, have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. You see, when you feel like you're all alone, uh, it can be because of what your job is and what your task is. In the previous, uh, Paul talks about how he is the apostle and, and by grace. And he's set to give a message to them, actually several lifeline, vital messages. And yet there was a, a delay. And he tells us, I would not have you ignorant. God is letting you know that even when there's delays, I don't want you ignorant concerning these things that I'm coming to impart to you. Do not want you ignorant. And here, we're not to be ignorant that it's a mystery. It's a mystery. Now, mainly what, what the revelation is, is about the church. But it's a mystery so that we not be wise in our own conceits, how that we can figure things out, how that we can... Uh, lay one thing next to another thing and compare. And yes, we should do that, but not wise in our own conceit. As a matter of fact, let me go all the way down to that. That's 25. And look up this word conceit. Ah, yes, there it is. And uh, uh, hail to, hail to. It's from a reflective noun, um, that's obsolete at the time, but it's in conjunction with that personal pronoun uh, that it's mine, you know, your own, so that God is letting, letting us know that you're supposed to think and you're supposed to understand, but not to, the, not to your own mind. 
you're supposed to seek out the mind of God. Seek out the will of God. Remember, I just uh, recently did uh, the broadcast on his uh, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's God that works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's what we want to seek out, not our own conceits. That's why we study, to make our um, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman, yes, you work at it. Uh, you do make the charts and the graphs. That's things that I do. And you do make the list and the comparisons. And you do look up the definitions and all of that. And I mind you, you don't just look up a definition in a commentary or a dictionary and not even, <coughs> pardon me, your Bible dictionary. Um, uh, but you look it up by looking up how God uses that word in all of the scriptures, knowing that the first time he uses that word in scripture is where the core of the meaning is any time you see that. But when you do that, you're not being wise in your own conceit and by your own study and by piling up your own. Because we see that a lot in the scriptures, the false prophets. They, they know how to do everything that the God's prophets know how to do except for keeping it holy, except for um, knowing the mind of God and understanding they weigh things out and say, well, this must be what God thinks because this is going on and that's going on. But a prophet has the wisdom to notice, ask God, what is the interpretation of the matter? What is it that you are saying? Reveal it unto me, Lord, not wise in your own conceits. What has this to do with your purpose? What has this to do with your will? How am I supposed to carry out my call or my message that you've given for this particular thing? So on this in particular, because we can, uh, just in my lifetime, there's been uh, the idea that Israel, all, all of Israel's promises are given to the church. That's just not so. That, that happened from us being wise in our own conceits, how we figured. Because during my lifetime, um, it was looked at that Israel messed up so bad that uh, God is bringing, bringing in the Gentiles, well, I, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness, oh, it happened, in part is happened to Israel unto the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So the blindness that you see, while it looks so totally to you, or to me, uh, when we're looking at it, or to the commentators at the time that I got saved in the late 60s, um, the, the popular idea was Israel was done and would not be redeemed, and all of the promises belonged to the church. And that's just not so. Blindness in part happened. And, and back in those times, when we looked at the blindness of Israel, it, we thought that we understood complete and total but the scripture was there and we didn't take it into account that blindness in part is happened to Israel unto the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And we need to understand from God what each of those is. So he says, and so in the next verse, 26, Romans eleven twenty six, all Israel. See, believe God, believe his holy word, the holy scriptures. All Israel shall be saved as it is written. And you do want to know that when God said it is written, it's written. And when he says um, that the, what the word of the Lord spoke, it's spoken. But when he says it's written, it's recorded as it is written. And you can almost always find it in, in your old covenant. And I say almost always because I learned a pattern about that. That when God says it is written, it's written in the Old Covenant. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer. So he's letting you know what's written so you can go back and see it. Uh, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. See, he's not talking about, we know Jesus Christ uh, for this to save the world from sin which we want to say what God said so that we can understand what God said and have what God said. But here he's letting us know what God said, what is written, 
and for some of you that I share Kingdom Bank with, the writing a thing down is, is, is important the same way we understand about saying. You need to say. Uh, there's some things about writing. God says it is written because there's some, some in a import that has to do with it, what is written. And he says, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Now, that makes it so that um, a Hebrew or uh, the, the Israel can look and see that Jesus is to take away their sins. And that's why they had to listen and make sure that they could follow God when, remember the, the um, uh, vision Peter had on the rooftop, and and. He sends him to Gentile, Gentile sent, him, sent him to Cornelius' house of the Italian band. Yeah, the Italians were the first Gentiles to come to the Lord. And, and God did that. He did that by Father, Son, Holy Ghost decree. Because with this right here, the Israel, Israel could think that salvation is for them and them only. They could think that God called them out and them only. But remember before the calling out, there was Melchizedek, the high priest, high priest in Salem. So all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer. And when God's, uh, when the, the, uh, the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob now we need to understand about these things and not be ignorant that not only will God do something do these things but the intricacy that goes with it that there can be ungodliness among God's called out ones God's people but he will deal with it and he won't just punish and and condemn but he will deliver he'll take us take the godliness, the ungodliness out of us and bring us to godliness. For this is my covenant. Now notice it can't just be because you think so, because you want so, but because God decreed it so, it is his covenant when I shall take away their sins. And he, he says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake so that you can come in. But as touching the election... They are beloved for the Father's sake. I would not have you ignorant. Your name is higher than any other. To every nation And here I will lift my voice in praise Your truth is my shield You're my cover Your faithfulness is to end Okay, now buckle your seat belts for this one. He, uh, I would not have you ignorant. Now these are things that I would. God says I would not have you ignorant, and all seven are things that the body of Christ has to ha, is quite ignorant and quite divided on. Now, the the third one, for, uh, 1 Corinthians ten one, and I hope you turn to it. If not, make sure you do it sometime. Moreover, brethren. I would not have you, I, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea 
and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all did eat the same spiritual meat, and all did drink the same spiritual rock, for they all drank of that rock, pardon me, of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now that went all the way to what? Verse 4. God would not have us ignorant. Now, first of all, I have a course on the baptisms that are mentioned in the New Testament. Most of us only know uh, two, but there are several in the New Testament. And this is one of them. And he says, I wouldn't have you ignorant. And most of us don't even know anything about this or, or don't. We read it and we think we don't know. I like to tell you that when God's word ingests and becomes a part of you. So if you read this, yeah, you knew and it's part of you. But I would not have you ignorant. And he says, what don't I want you ignorant about? The how. How that all our fathers, okay? He says the how. They were under the cloud and they passed through the sea. So they weren't dipped in water, for those of us that know water baptism. They weren't plunged in the water, remember, because they passed through on dry, dra dry ground. But he says, I don't want you ignorant. And I don't want you ignorant too either. Uh, I like to agree with God. But this was so delightful when he gave me some revelation on this thing. Not just the reading and not just the meditation and not just the study. But he also gave some revelation on this. Uh, when he gave me about the different baptisms. But he says, under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. By the way, um, a remote context of this, because our clouds today are having some, uh, man is messing with things in the air. And the heavens are the Lord's. <laughs> you know, the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. We tend to forget, since we're talking about the earth, that, that the generation of heaven and earth has its firmament under the heaven, and those happen to be the clouds. And God does some things in the cloud for his testimony, and he doesn't want us messing with the clouds. And yet now in our day and time, well, actually for longer than that, that we've been messing with the clouds, and we cause some things to happen in the clouds, and they look different than what they would. But... I would not have you ignorant how, how it happened, that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses. Notice, baptized unto Moses. Sometimes when we get too religious about uh, what a man can do or a man or woman of God can do, we, we want to... Uh, take away the names and let it all be Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And it sounds so good because we're supposed to lift up the name of Jesus. He's the one that said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Uh, he's the one that let us know that we do things in his name. But here, if God has called you out to be this kind of leader, that some things are going to have your name stamped on them, please know just from this scripture that God does that kind of thing. And Moses was the baby in the family. All were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Just a remote context there. So that those of you that God has called out um, and, and made all that, please understand, like Moses, you're going to have a whole bunch of opposition of those who are older and know, think that they're wiser and more called and were called before you were and so on and so forth. And they'll feel that way. But like Paul wrote to Timothy, and this is scripture. It's not just Paul said something to Timothy. It is the holy scripture. Let no man despise your youth. Just because you just, you're just you the Johnny come lately, they'll like to tell you. No, nah, that was Moses. He was the baby. But God did so much in him and through him and because of him. And... So we have the testimony in the word, the eternal, holy scriptures, and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And in is actually the in. That's why it's baptism, because it's actually in. Even though it looked like they're passing through, 
it is in, he's letting us know. And all did eat that same spiritual meat. And and this if this is too much, uh, uh, somebody told me years ago, double talk. God doesn't double talk. But he does let you know what's going on. And it can be multifaceted because he made us able to understand. The same way he gave you five fingers on one hand. He made you to understand several things at one time in conjunction with a thing. And so he says, all did eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. And if you're wondering what he's talking about, he spells it out for you. They for, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. Like, oh, the rock is following us? Oh, no, no, I follow Jesus. No, that's you being religious. He said here, that followed them. And that rock was Christ. You want <laughs> goodness and mercy follows me? Follow me all the days of my life? Yeah, you want that. And understand, understand, I would not have you ignorant. I would not have you not knowing. I would not have you lack of information or intelligence. I wouldn't have you without discrimination and without discernment on the matter. I would not have you to not know, uh, to, and for, whether it's unknown or ununderstood, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. And he said how it happened, how it happened. So that uh, we were talking about the Enlightenment period yesterday, how that in the Enlightenment period they thought, well, certain things that are written in the Bible couldn't possibly have happened that way because we learned some things about the earth. And the way the earth works, from what we learned, it just couldn't have happened that way. Well, you need to believe the Holy Scriptures. Because since then, as a matter of fact, even in my college days, uh, certain thing, uh, things happened in archaeology that made us know it absolutely some of the things that in the Enlightenment period were said that couldn't have happened, they were unearthed. It was dug up, and the proofs of them were there. But there, it's not proof because we found it in archaeology. The proof is God said so. And another thing that I want to point out here on I would not have you ignorant, God is his own best interpreter. God himself, he says what he means. So that's why we want to say what he says. Whether we understand that thing or not, we want to say what he said so that he gives us the understanding of what he said and not what we can figure out. Because remember, like that other, and I would not have you ignorant, we'll be wise in our own conceit. We'll think we figured it out. God is his own interpreter. And the word of God is its own best commentary. See, if I only gave you, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. I would not that ye should ye should be ignorant how that our fathers that were were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. As you go on, he's his own commentary. The Holy Scriptures is its own commentary. I love commentaries. Love to study with them, but they don't interpret the word. God interprets him his word himself, and he gives you the explanation. And all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now we have a baptism, and we didn't realize that it was a baptism, and all did eat of that same spiritual meat. All did drink that same spiritual drink. So we understand. I love it that my uh, God gave my son a song. Come, this is my body. Come, this is my blood. And as often as you do, remember me. And he says, come and eat. Come and drink. Uh, oh, no, that's wine in the wilderness. I'm sorry. If you heard that, I uh, and it's the song Wine in the Wilderness, you, uh, you heard me mix it up with Come, This is My Body, the communion song. But wine in the wilderness was, was what God gave us when he gave, the, uh, gave my husband and I for the children to understand these things in the word. And when, they, when the understanding came, then he would give us the song. And, and wine in the wilderness, there's wine in the wilderness. And here in the scriptures, he lets us know, that they did eat, come and eat, and be set free. And he said they drank that spiritual drink, come and drink. For they all drank that spiritual rock. 
not just the water that he, when he made water come out of a rock, but that rock was Christ. So that's not just uh, your H2O water. Now notice, but with many of them, was uh, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Notice that there's wine in the wilderness, and there's provision for you in your wilderness. But if you refuse God, if you insist on being wise in your own conceit, as they said, you know, why this Moses bring us out here to kill us? Uh, we, didn't, we, we want to go back to the meat in Egypt. No, 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 no. If you're wise in your own conceit, if you figure that you went from a bad place to a worse place when God brought you to the place, when you figure that uh, because of some trials that you don't want to go through, you'll be overthrown in your wilderness. And you won't even get back to what you're trying to get back to. You'll be overthrown right in your wilderness. No, come and eat and be set free. Come and drink of that wine. Because that rock, they all did drink that same spiritual rock. Uh, drink, pardon me. And they drank that of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Some the ones that were overthrown, they're so busy looking at that the Egyptians are following them, not realizing that their Redeemer, their Savior, was following them. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust as after evil things as they lusted. Neither be idolaters, as were some of them. And uh, some of you remember the scripture about idolatry is as the sin of witchcraft. Okay? Stubbornness is idolatry. And we make a joke about being stubborn. But no, no. I would not have you ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. I would not have you ignorant. I would not have you ignorant. Seven times it's said in the scriptures. And these are things that God seriously doesn't want us ignorant about. So, the third one we just dealt with. So we're going to number four. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spirituals, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And Please understand the context that God gives. The very next verse, before he goes on to tell you what I don't want you to be ignorant about, he gives you some context where we were wise in our own conceits. 
And verse 2, he says, You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. <coughs> now, I read that fast on purpose. Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols. The carrying away imitates in, uh, being in the spirit. And the the prop the uh, the false prophets they imitated the things of God, and uh, one of the reasons uh, liquor is called spirits is because it it moves and it takes you into another place, and takes over your spirit by its spirit. And so he says, you know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols, and the carrying away. He says, wherefore, in verse 3, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth, calleth Jesus accursed. Okay, if you're in some kind of spirit, and I say some kind because he's letting you know that what, what you used to know when you were Gentiles, now you're in Christ. You're drunk of the spiritual rock. You know something else, and what you know is holy. He says, wherefore, I give you to understand. I don't want you to stay ignorant on spirituals but first of all we're going to clear up this thing about being in the spirit and in the spirit yes you'll you might look like oh that you're you're being overtaken and overcome yes the holy spirit can overwhelm you yes the glory of god is overwhelming yes but he says i give you to understand that no man speaking by the spirit of god calls Jesus accursed and he does say call it uh, and King James lets you know he doesn't he didn't do it he's not going to do it now and he's not going to keep on doing it uh, you see there's a doctrine um, when you understand that that Jesus uh, the the sin of us was laid on him there came up a doctrine that he is cursed he became uh, he the curse. The scripture has something to say about it. But when you understand what God is saying, that he took on the curse, you're not going to say that Jesus, you're not going to call him accursed. And not by the Holy Spirit, not by the Spirit of God. And that no man can say Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. You want to understand that. Now, so many of us so easily say that I love the Lord, or I'm saved, or I'm this, I'm that. He's specifically talking about being under that influence of that, uh, you know, when you can look at a person and see that they're under the influence of the Spirit of God. They're not calling Jesus Lord on their own and out of their own spirit, but by the Holy Ghost. And let me see. I want to go back and... and uh, well, I won't take the time now, but you go back and look in your Hebrew to see is the the there, because that's to let you know that he's speaking of the actual person of the Holy Ghost and not just how he is. When the article is present, uh, it's about the actual object or, or person. When the uh, ob uh, article is absent, it's about the attributes, the characteristics. And here it is the, ta, if you want the Hebrew, ta numa ta hagian. Actually, actually it's ta hagian, the holy numa. So I would not have you ignorant. Now I want to get through these other things that he would not have you ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant because he lets you know that that whole subject of spirituals is verses uh, 4, 5, and 6. Gifts of the Spirit, administrations of the Lord, operations of God, verses 12, 13, and 14, pardon me, chapters 12, 13, and 14 cover those three aspects. I would not have you, now concerning spirituals, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now the next one is 2 Corinthians 1, 8. So let's go to 2 Corinthians 1. Paul, an apostle again, of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Timothy, uh, Timothy, our brother, unto the church which is at Corinth, with all the saints, and you do realize, uh, which are in all of uh, Archaea. 
and he says grace and peace be to you he says all that we're going to verse 8 he says for we would not brethren have you ignorant of our trouble now go back to verse 7 actually verse verse 5 for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us a whole lot this whole lot of it so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ you need to know uh, one of the baptisms baptism of suffering that with it is abundance of consolation the same way that um, Peace be still, the song that we get it from, where Jesus spoke to the great storm. The scripture says it was a great storm. And then he said, don't be afraid. And then he spoke to the storm. He said, be muzzled. The scripture tells us it was a great calm. When there's a great affliction, there's going to be great consolation. There's also going to be great reward. That part he's not addressing here. But he says, I wouldn't have you ignorant. Um, and whether you be afflicted, it is whether we be afflicted for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual. It has effect, not just affect, effect. It's getting certain things done to the enduring of the same sufferings so that you don't just want to get out of it, but you want it to go its course to accomplish what it's for, which we also suffer. So that's part of that baptism of suffering. One of the, I have a whole course on the baptisms that are in the New Testament. One of them is the baptism of suffering. And we need to understand this. What does he say? For I would not have you ignorant of our trouble. We need to be able to understand that baptism of suffering. We need to understand um, which came to us in Asia, which that we were pressed out of measure. That can happen. And you don't say that it's not God. I would not have you ignorant. I'm letting you know it's part of that baptism of suffering. That uh, it's in the word of God. In our new covenant. And Paul is showing them here. In verse 8. Uh, of our trouble. The trouble that came at a certain time in a certain place. And yes, we were pressed out of measure. It looked that bad. It was that bad. I know many times I would uh, bring something to the Lord. And um, someone likes to uh, tell me, uh, actually they spread it around to people uh, about one of my daughters. That, oh, she's dramatic. Yes, 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 she is. But she's of truth. They tried to make it because there's drama that there's no truth. No. You look at Ezekiel, God gave him to act out the prophecy. He gave him some, some drama to it. You look at God shaking the mountain and causing it to uh, lightning and fire. There's drama to it because he's going to deliver some truth to you. But uh, here we're finding out that yes, yes, there's some drama going on. Pressed out of measure. I know I used to want, want God to tell me that it's not that bad. And he would let me know, no, it's that bad. And I'm resurrection. I'm life. And I bring gold out of the ashes. And I was so wanting God to tell me it just wasn't that bad. And he's saying here, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, of our trouble. It's trouble. We also want the miracle where God delivers us from, from everything and not to anything. And he says, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure. You see, we normally, when things get that bad, we want to go pull on that scripture that uh, God won't put uh, anything on uh, put you anything on you that you can't bear. You need to read the rest of the verse. Read on. God is His own best commentary. Read on. He says, without a way of escape, some things are more than you can bear, and He gives you the way of escape. Some things you will be pressed. It's not going to separate you from the love of God, but it can be out of measure. It can be more than what makes any kind of sense in what, what we are able, except in Christ, our way of escape. Above strength. Uh, I will tell you just by personal testimony. I went through something and I'm strong. I'm, God made me strong. 
and he showed me that where I had no more strength even to breathe air and he did it for me and he showed me himself showed me the word but he showed me himself where he said that he is my strength you can be pressed out of measure and beyond strength or above the scripture says inasmuch as we were we despaired even of life he's not talking about hoping to die what I just shared with you the thing that I'd gone through that I share with you often about Jesus in the garden he wasn't saying uh, take the cup away from me that I don't have want to die it was the dying at the moment and not at the cross for what your purpose is you can have situations press you to the point that there's no life and when the circumstance had pressed me to the point that I didn't have breath I found out that he will even actually breathe and I mean aspirate for you he will be your strength. But let's look at here what he says. Um, for in verse 7, he says, For our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so also of the consolation. You need to know that. You need to know that there were, there is such a thing as suffering suffering above, uh, out of measure, and above, pressed out of measure, above strength, in so much that you can despair even of life. But there's a fellowship of suffering. There's a fellowship in it. And there's consolation. I would not have you ignorant, brethren. I would not have you ignorant. Of our trouble which came to us in Asia that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much as we despaired of life but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we would not trust in ourselves but in God which raises the dead who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver. And ye also, helping together by prayer, see, don't get so caught up in what's how bad it is that you help by prayer, that for the gift upon us, which is upon us by means of many persons, uh, thanks may be given by many on our behalf so you see there's thanks and he goes on to tell you that there's rejoicing in this the testimony of our conscience I wouldn't have you ignorant there's suffering that is that bad and then in First Thessalonians look at the others we won't get to finish them today but I would not have you ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow not you see, there's suffering and there's things that go on and that happen, but it's not to make you despair. I would not have you ignorant, brethren. You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God. God has blessed the work of your hands and you walk in favor with God and man. You think from the word and you make wise moves. You are blessed and excel in all that you do. You always attract people of wisdom and an excellent spirit and you engage in transactions and situations of vast, excellent and lasting merit. You are occupied with people and endeavors on a plane of timely, immediate, high and positive return in the internal, the external, and the eternal realm, in the temporal, the celestial, the natural, the spiritual, in the personal, interpersonal, community, national, and global. You move in all that pertains to life and godliness, according to the promises of God in all of their fullness. You are continuously and profoundly supplied in time, resources, wisdom, and health, in favor and finance, and all manner of wealth, in revelation and vision of things present and things to come, in the knowledge and understanding 
understanding and zeal of the Holy One. You are called to his glory, his virtue, and his praise. You are elected to his power, his loving kindness, and his grace. You are clothed with humility, and you are prudent in matters. You are blessed and anointed, highly favored and appointed, and you are full of the word of God and its demonstration. God has appointed your going out and your coming in. He has ordained that your very life exemplify him. Righteousness, justice, and holiness unto the Lord is the mark of your call. And the resurrection power and the glory of God, you will fulfill all. You are blessed and anointed of God. You are ablaze with the glory of God. 